So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this combined Medical Center Hour Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here at the School of Medicine. And we're pleased to present this program, which is also the 2016 uh, Hayden Farr Lecture in Epidemiology and Virology. This program is a collaborative effort, uh, Medical Center Hour, Department of Medicine, um, and then, as I mentioned, the Hayden Farr Lectureship in Epidemiology and Virology. This lectureship is made possible by the distinguished UVA virologist and professor emeritus, Jack Waltney, who is here with us today. Uh, it honors in name uh, two other UVA virology experts, Dr. Barry Farr, formerly UVA's hospital epidemiologist, and Dr. Frederick Hayden, both of whom have retired but remain in the area. Dr. Hayden actually lives something of a global life, frequently engaged with the World Health Organization on medical and policy matters of epidemic and pandemic viral infections. Viruses play a significant and significantly disruptive role in our lives as individuals, communities, and globally. And contrary to optimistic expectations some decades ago, viruses haven't all been tamed. Indeed, some pose considerable threat to life and well-being, especially in a world of global travel and trade. They dominate headlines and prompt medical, public health, and policy responses. The Hayden Farr Lecture is turning out to be one way we are able to get the word out. A case in point, last year's Hayden Farr Lecture focused on the Ebola virus and the epidemic that surged in West Africa. This year, the virus making headlines is Zika. And this mosquito-borne infection spreading in part because of climate change as well as international trade and tourism has serious medical public health, environmental, social, and bioethical challenges associated with it. We're so pleased to have with us today Dr. Lyle Peterson, Director of the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And since Zika came to great public notice, Dr. Peterson has also been the Incident Manager for Zika Response at the CDC. He is here to give us what will be an up-to-the-minute report on Zika, the science, and the situation, from his privileged perspective on the front lines of our efforts to know, to stop, and to deal with this virus and its effect on humans. I'd like to thank Dr. Fred Hayden and Dr. Kosti Seafree for their help in making this program happen. Also to Dr. Gwaltney for making this lectureship happen. And let me mention that Dr. Peterson had no uh, financial conflicts of interest to declare. Welcome to Lyle Peterson, and now Zika, the science and the situation. So uh, thank you and good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's my first time at UVA, and I'm happy to be here. So. So Zika virus, um, so for the first time in history, our director, Tom Frieden, mentioned that never before in history has there been a situation where the bite from a mosquito could result in a devastating malformation. And in fact, Zika virus is the first known major cause of birth effects in 50 years, the last being rubella. Um, it's also the first mosquito-borne virus uh, that has been spread sexually as well. So there's a number of firsts with this virus. So um, first we'll start with a, just a basic description of what Zika virus is. It's a single-stranded RNA virus. It is a flavivirus. virus, flavi meaning yellow in Latin. So it's related to the yellow fever virus, uh, as well as dengue, Japanese encephalitis, and West Nile viruses. Uh, there are two genotypes of uh, Zika virus, the African genotype found in Africa, and the Asian genotype uh, found known for more than 50 years to be present in Southeast Asia. And phylogenetic analysis uh, suggests that the Asian strain of the virus 
had its origin in Uganda about 1945. It's uh, primarily transmitted by two Aedes species mosquitoes, um, Aedes aegypti, shown in the uh, picture above, shown about twice normal size. And, uh, and Aedes albopictus, or the Asian tiger mosquito, uh, which is a lesser vector, but also uh, potentially important. And I'll come back and talk about these two uh, mosquitoes in more detail in a little bit later in the talk. So this is, a, um, Zika virus is a newly emerging pathogen. Now, it was discovered in 1947. Uh, isolated from a macaque in the Zika forest. And these are pictures uh, here. This is, I took this picture. Uh, it's located near the uh, airport in Entebbe. So if you're ever in Uganda, stop by the Zika forest. And you can also see on this slide, for those of you towards the front, that the British spells Zika with two eyes. Uh, I asked the Ugandans about that, and they told me, that's eh, just the British. <laughs> but anyway, this is an old picture of the Zika forest, and what you can see here is the Zika Tower. It still exists, and you can actually climb this thing. It's one of the most scary things I've ever done in my life, because if there's a ladder that goes straight up there, and if you fall down, you go straight down 120 feet. And it's got these platforms here. You can see one there and one there. And so what they were doing back in the day, in, in the late 40s, was trying to figure out the transmission cycle of the yellow fever virus. And different mosquitoes fly at different levels of the tree canopy. So what they would do is they'd put, uh, in this case, a macaque at various levels of this tower and see what diseases they actually got and what mosquitoes were feeding on them. Well, one of those uh, monkeys, or the macaque, developed a febrile illness and then was subsequently uh, found to have Zika virus, and that's how it was discovered in this very location. So before 2007, uh, there were only 14 sporadic human disease cases reported in Africa and Southeast Asia of Zika virus. So it was thought to be a very uncommon uh, cause of febrile illness. Nobody really cared much about it. Um, until 2007, when there was a, this outbreak, and strangely enough, on the island of the App, which is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the Federated States of Micronesia, has a population of 7,300. And this was the first outbreak of Zika virus ever discovered. And so actually my group investigated this outbreak, and the attack rate among the island population was astoundingly 73%. So three quarters of the entire population of this island got Zika virus during this outbreak. And about 20% of those people were symptomatic. And that's when we talk about one out of five people getting symptomatic, that's where these data come from. And this was the Asian genotype uh, that caused this outbreak on, on Yap. And it's the ancestors of this Asian genotype virus that's causing all of the outbreaks across the uh, world today. So the virus then started spreading from island to island around the Pacific. And in 2013 and 2014, it caused this huge outbreak on uh, French Polynesia and involving more than 30,000 cases, uh, suspected cases of Zika virus. So this was the largest outbreak known to at that uh, today. Well, the virus kept spreading across the Pacific and got to Easter Island, and I thought, okay, well, here it comes, and it did come. And in March 2015, the Asian gen genotype first was identified in the Americas in Brazil. And in September 2015, the first instance of uh, infants born with microcephaly were noted in northeastern Brazil. And after this event in Brazil, people thought, well, it caused this huge outbreak in Polynesia. Why did you see microcephaly? And so they went back, and in fact, they discovered that there was an outbreak of microcephaly following the outbreak in Polynesia that was not recognized at the time. So on this graph here, uh, this is weeks. By 2015-2016, uh, these bars represent cases of microcephaly, 
This green line here represents the outbreak of Zika virus in uh, Pernambuco <coughs> up in northeastern Brazil. And you can see that this outbreak happened. This is in the setting of a very large outbreak in blue of, of dengue. And there's a couple points here. One point is this outbreak was here. Microcephaly started here. And if you kind of subtract this time from this time, you can surmise that that infections were caused by, uh, excuse me, microcephaly was caused by infections pretty much only in the first trimester of, of, um, of gestation. Uh, subsequent to this outbreak, there was this huge outbreak, a second wave of uh, Zika virus in Brazil, and there's going to be a subsequent, another secondary uh, outbreak of microcephaly uh, yet to come in that country. So the current situation uh, it, for Zika virus is, is almost biblical in, in proportion. 73 countries now report mosquito-borne transmission since 2007. 56 experienced the first outbreak since 2015. 10 have had outbreaks before 2016, but no cases in 2016. And these are primarily small countries in the Pacific where the virus went through the population and essentially burned out, uh, infected a big enough proportion of the population that there weren't enough susceptibles left. 12 countries have reported sexual transmission. And the sexual transmission has only really been noted in countries like the United States or in Europe because in countries where the virus has rampant mosquito-borne transmission, it's impossible to know how you got infected. Did you get infected from your partner? Or did you get infected from the mosquito? Uh, and remarkably now, 22 countries are now known to have microcephaly uh, for, resulting from local uh, Zika virus transmission. And on this graph, what I've indicated is these are cumulative areas reporting mosquito-borne Zika virus transmission by WHO reporting region. And so this light blue color is uh, the Americas. And you can see that the virus was introduced around the end of 2000, well, it actually took off around the end of 2015. And you can see within a course of about six months, it infected local transmission occurred in almost every single country in the Americas, save Canada. Um, so, I mean, a truly remarkable spread of the virus. So, to kind of understand this, I'm going to go back and give you our virology 101 here. Um, and this is a very simplified schematic version of what happens in nature, but I think it illustrates a few points. So on your left uh, is, <coughs> indicates what happens with a disease like West Nile. So for West Nile, the virus is circulating between uh, mosquitoes and birds, and so there's a transmission amplification cycle um, in nature and it's only when this cycle amplifies enough that you get so many infected mosquitoes that, that they begin to bite people and it, it becomes a human infection risk. With this kind of scenario, humans do not develop a very high level of viremia. So they don't infect mosquitoes. So humans are dead in post. Now this is the situation that occurs with West Nile and some of its relatives. So uh, this is primarily a monkey virus um, and circulates in, in the jungles of Africa and potentially Asia um, in a cycle involving uh, mosquitoes and monkeys. And it's only when people begin to you know, enter forest areas that they may accidentally get bit by one of these forest dwelling um, Aedes or Haemagogus mosquitoes. So in this case, nothing really happens. People are pretty spread far apart. The difference here is that these viruses are very unique. There's about 150 uh, arboviruses that infect humans, but only a handful of them 
um, can form this kind of a situation where you've got a transmission cycle between mosquitoes and people where humans become the primary host. And it's probably no accident that we may be related to monkeys um, genetically. And, and so but in this urban epidemic cycle, there's only two mosquitoes that are, are important. Aedes aegypti, uh, or the, otherwise known as the yellow fever mosquito, uh, which is by far the most important, and Aedes albopictus, which is the Asian tiger mosquito, which is a less important uh, mosquito. And these spread dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya, and Zika, all the ones you've heard about in the news. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about some more of the biology that explains what's going on with all of these, these diseases. So there's uh, differences between the enzootic and the urban epidemics uh, spread that I just talked about, and, which are important for understanding kind of where this outbreak is going and why it's happened. So with the example of West Nile virus, humans don't infect mosquitoes. Humans thus are incidental hosts. Uh, we develop lifelong immunity, but human herd immunity is not relevant. It doesn't matter if you're infected for the virus, say, because the virus does not circulate between humans and mosquitoes. And so thus, human travel is irrelevant. With these other viruses, dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya, and Zika, what happens is, is that humans readily infect mosquitoes, Humans become the amplifying hosts of the virus. They're, although we, de we develop lifelong immunity, so, we can, so human herd immunity is important, and it's spread by human travel, because these mosquitoes don't go very far. They're, Aedes aegypti are pretty lazy mosquitoes. They may fly about 120 uh, yards in their lifetime, but people get on planes and come to UVA or places like that and spread this infection. So this Aedes aegypti mosquito, the yellow fever mosquito, is, is bad news from a number of ways. That makes it a very efficient spreader of Zika virus. For one, it, it, it has adapted over the years to live around humans. It likes humans. It prefers to bite humans. And by the way, it's only the female mosquito that bites humans. Um, because she needs the, your blood to get the protein to make her eggs. Uh, this mosquito feeds primarily during the daytime. It often bites indoors. So if you go, uh, let's say, to Puerto Rico or some tropical area, if you look in people's closets, for example, you will find these mosquitoes sitting on the walls of their closets, which makes uh, control efforts outdoors rather difficult when the mosquitoes are inside. But what makes it bad is it feeds on multiple humans in a single blood meal. So it's a very fickle kind of mosquito. It's easily disturbed. So, uh, the so she may come and bite you, and then you move, and then she goes on to the next person in the household, and then goes on to the next person in the household. And, and so that provides ample opportunity for the mosquito to pick up the virus but it also provides ample opportunity for the mosquito to spread the virus. So one mosquito in a single blood meal often will infect everybody in the household. It's also very difficult to control. It, she, she's very uh, careful about where she lays her eggs. And many kinds of mosquitoes will lay all their eggs in one pool of water. Aedes aegypti will go from lay a few eggs here and a few eggs there and a few eggs over there and so it's very difficult because any pool of water could potentially have uh, her eggs in it. It breeds in very small pools of water, so pools of water the size of a bottle cap basically can breed these mosquitoes, uh, and which leads to uh, cryptic breeding sites. You basically cannot find all of the breeding sites for these mosquitoes. So these efforts to get people to drain their flower pots or whatever don't work because people simply cannot find all of the breeding sites in a modern or urban environment. And outdoor control may not kill these mosquitoes that are hanging out indoors. 
So this is the distribution of these two mosquitoes. Um, this is the distribution of Aedes aegypti, and you can see it's present throughout the tropical world. It's primarily a tropical mosquito. Here's the distribution in the United States. And for up here, it doesn't, in these nor more northern areas, it doesn't mean that mosquitoes here all the time. They're often brought in, you know, through travel and trade, through uh, and <coughs> populated areas during the summer. So back in the day when we had these big yellow fever outbreaks, and um, which actually once killed the postmaster general of the U.S. up here in Philadelphia, they were primarily introductions during the summertime in these more northern areas. Uh, this is the distribution of Aedes albopictus. This is not such a great vector in the sense that this mosquito will bite anybody or anything, um, as opposed to Aedes aegypti, which will primarily bite people. And so if it bites you, picks up the virus, and then bites the cat, nothing's going to happen. Uh, and, but the difference is, is that this Aedes albopictus is more of a temperate uh, mosquito and uh, inhabits areas further north in the United States, uh, indicating that there is some potential for transmission in areas more further north. So why is Zika spreading now? And I think there are really two reasons, now that you know a little bit about mosquito biology. One is, is that we are experiencing the largest migration of humans ever in the history of this planet. And in fact, more people have migrated from rural areas to urban areas in the last 30 years than have ever lived in the previous human race back since we began. And so this is the population of the urban population of the, of the world. This is the rural population of the world. And as you can see, more of the world starting about in 2000, there was a switchover, and now the majority of people in the world live in urban areas. Well, think about it. Aedes aegypti is an urban mosquito that thrives on crowded conditions. And what do you have? You have megacities in, in the, throughout the third world with, with inadequate water supplies, people crammed together, certainly no air conditioning or screens on their houses. It is the perfect setup for the spread of this uh, disease. And diseases like it spread by this mosquito. The other factor is people move around. And for, for a disease that where humans are the primary host, this is what's, what's spreading this so rapidly around the world. Uh, these are international arrivals. And the remarkable thing is, uh, back here in the 50s, there were about 25 million international arrivals per year. Right now, we've, we're up at 1.1 billion international arrivals per year. So in less than one generation, we have had more than a 50-fold uh, difference increase in people crossing the international border. So you've got the perfect nightmare scenario for the spread of this disease, or diseases like it. So what we've seen is dengue, dengue spread by Aedes aegypti has increased 30-fold in the last 20 years in incidence. Chikungunya spread throughout the entire entire tropical world uh, a couple years ago, also spread by Aedes aegypti, uh, spread throughout the Americas in rapid fashion, just like Zika, and now we've got Zika virus uh, doing exactly the same thing. So this is really uh, an issue of urbanization and uh, international travel. So this is the situation in the world right now. And I've Design this in a couple of, or put this in a few chunks. Uh, first chunk is Africa. And uh, what you can see is a few countries have no noted Zika virus transmission, but the reality is there's no surveillance and there's no birth defect surveillance. So we have no idea whether microcephaly is occurring there or not. There's none reported. So this is kind of a black box, but we do know the virus is circulating throughout much of Africa, we just don't know how much. So here we are in Southeast Asia, and this is a map by the European CDC, and you can see that they colored Thailand uh, red, indicating that there's widespread transmission in the last three months. Now, 
What I told you before is the Asian genotype virus has been present in Southeast Asia for more than 50 years. But what's happened is, is that Thailand all of a sudden started saying, well, there's a Zika problem, let's start testing for it. So they've increased testing for Zika virus a hundredfold in the last two years. As a result, they've discovered more than a thousand cases of Zika virus uh, in the last year. And within the last two weeks, they've discovered two cases of microcephaly. Now, the real question is, is there really something different going on now? Or are they just uncovering a problem that was there all along? This has some real implications for what we advise people, let's say pregnant women, going to Southeast Asia. Is this something new, or is this something that's been there all along? And what kind of a travel guidance do we get for people? The one place they are having an outbreak is in Singapore. Um, Singapore actually did something that was good and potentially bad. The good part was they're actually the one place that's managed to control dengue through a, a very extensive mosquito control effort. But, what they, and, but what's happened is they've had dengue outbreaks uh, in recent years because the population herd immunity went down, so they just get more propensity to outbreaks at lower infestation levels. Well, if you think about it, they, if Zika was endemic there, they may have very well lowered the Zika population immunity and thus potentially set, this, set it up for an outbreak. Well, we'll see. Oops. So the next area of the world is the, the Pacific Islands. Yap is located about there. Uh, so in this area of the world, the virus has already swept through. These are low, small population islands for the most part where the majority of people have gotten infected already. So the virus is pretty much burning out in these locations. And then finally, uh, the Americas, which we all talk about in more detail uh, coming up, but we've got uh, outbreaks are mostly waning in the Americas at this point, but the microcephaly has yet to be seen. And then we have uh, India, and we know that there's outbreaks occurring in the Maldives. But this place, is, India is loaded with Aedes aegypti. They've had huge outbreaks of chikungunya. They've had huge outbreaks of dengue, but no Zika virus. And nobody knows why. Is it just something waiting to happen, or is there something unique about this area we just simply don't know? So this. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about what's happening in the Americas. So this is the outbreak in Brazil. It starts um, at the first of, of the year because that's when they started surveillance. And you can see that this outbreak went up and, and went down. But what's remarkable is, and you may not be able to read it, but the axis here is 20,000. They were reporting more than 20,000 cases of Zika virus per week. Think about that. Uh, Colombia also had a giant outbreak that started towards the end of uh, 2015, uh, went up and is now on the downward slope uh, with a peak of about 7,000 cases a week. And what's really interesting is about over here, as Colombia declared an end to their outbreak, and we're scratching our heads going, you're still having 500 cases a week and you're calling it over? And I guess if you have 7,000 cases a week, 500 is good. I don't know. Um, and this is uh, just some outbreak curves from some other countries in the Americas, uh, French-speaking countries. And you can see that the, in every single country, uh, the outbreak is starting to wane. But because of that time lapse between, because most infections that cause microcephaly are in the first trimester, the, the whole microcephaly epidemic is yet to occur. So this is where we are in the uh, United States. So, uh, so far we have 3,592 uh, travel-related cases. But if you really think about this, only one out of five people are symptomatic, and many of those who have symptoms have mild illness. So literally what this translates to, you know, the fact we found 3,500 imported cases means there's really probably been tens of thousands of importations into the uh, contiguous United States. 
Uh, we've had a, on here 101 officially reported cases. There's actually about 150, uh, all in Florida. And I'll come back to Florida in a bit. Uh, one locally acquired, laboratory acquired case. Uh, we have 30 recorded uh, cases of sexual transmission. So this is a you know, small number compared to what's coming in. And remarkably, we've had 837 pregnant women uh, that we know of that have Zika virus that we're following right now. And 12 people have developed guillain barre syndrome. The contrast, if you look at the U.S. territories, you know, we're up more than 24,000 cases, uh, almost all from Puerto Rico. And so far, we've had 1,600 pregnant women that have become infected, mostly in Puerto Rico, and 39 cases of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So the outbreaks in the tropical world, obviously, are, are much, much bigger. And this is uh, what we, the epidemic curve of these are cases coming into the United States. And you can see as the outbreak started, the virus started spreading in the middle of uh, 2016 throughout the Americas, the number of cases of imported cases uh, rose, has risen steadily. Actually, this is Puerto Rico. Sorry, I switched my slides. Um, but you can see Puerto Rico is going on. That hasn't stopped yet. This is the contiguous United States. And, uh, and this drop-off here is a reporting artifact. It's just reporting delay. The number of cases, we're still getting in about 250 to 300 cases of Zika virus every week. And this is where these travel-associated Zika virus cases have landed. Uh, about 700 in Florida, you know, 200 in Texas, lots in the New York metro area, 800 in New York State. And basically, these were people, um, were people from Latin America coming to the United States. 84 in Virginia. So this is where the outbreak, this is the only locally transmitted outbreak uh, in the United States so far. Um, it's been in these two areas. This is Miami-Dade County, southern Florida. Um, this area here is an area called Wynwood which is a touristy area. This area here uh, is Miami Beach. And there's a couple of things about this. Um, one is both of these areas are tourist areas. This area, this Miami Beach outbreak is centered around the convention center. Um, so when you've got infected people potentially coming in, that's where you're going to find these outbreaks, because there's plenty of mosquitoes in both of those locations. This outbreak was controlled. This one is not. And I will come back to that later. The other thing to note is these weird shaped islands out here. They don't have Zika. I've heard only rich people live on these weird shaped islands. So maybe uh, rich people don't get Zika. Um, so anyway, we're uh, going to talk about the clinical uh, aspects of virus right now. So the clinical illness is usually mild. Um, approximately, as I mentioned before, about 20% becomes symptomatic. Um, the median incubation period is about six days. We know that because we've followed people that have been exposed in other countries and have come back to the U.S. and have modeled the incubation period. And the most common symptoms are rash, and it's often puritic, and about 90% of the people will get a rash. It's a, uh, about 65% will get a fever, 65% arthritis or arthralgias, and about a little bit more than half are going to get a non permeant conjunctivitis. So these are really the symptoms that we look for um, and state health departments look for uh, when they agree to test people. Um, the symptoms generally only last a few days to a week. Uh, severe disease is uncommon and fatalities are rare. And so the, the interesting thing about this is that, not surprisingly, that most of the fatalities and severe illnesses we've seen with this are in people who previously had underlying conditions. Um, and, but occasionally what we'll find is people who will develop a dengue shock-like syndrome will drop out their platelets 
and, uh, and die from intracranial hemorrhages and, and things like that. Sort of like a few of these cases look a lot like dengue. So people focus on microcephaly, but it's very clear to us at this point in the game that this is really a whole spectrum of disease. And so we prefer to use congenital Zika syndrome. And uh, this, is, this picture is immunohistochemical staining, and you can see virus uh, present in the, in the brain of an of a infant that died. And so, uh, so congenital Zika syndrome, obviously microcephaly is something we're concerned about, but we also see intracranial calcifications, and I'll show you some examples of that and what that means as well as a variety of other brain abnormalities. Like one of the very unusual characteristics of this virus is that uh, these babies that are infected have no corpus callosum. Uh, Zika virus is also linked to a variety of ocular abnormalities, hearing loss, limb abnormalities, and impaired growth. So it's really a whole spectrum of illness. And so on, on this uh, slide, put down here is CNS development, and central nervous system development occurs all the way through adolescence. And so the potential to, to have a viral problem that's uh, neurotropic like this um, is, is a potential problem way beyond just microcephaly. And we really don't know the whole spectrum of neurological manifestations of this illness. However, um, what we've seen is, is that late in the first trimester is basically when all the microcephaly happens. And I think what's happening is before, if, if the fetus is infected before this point, the fetus probably dies uh, most of the time. And, and we've seen a number of uh, stillbirths uh, or spontaneous abortions as a result of, of Zika virus infection. After this point, the, the skull is well enough developed that you do not see uh, microcephaly any longer. So what is happening is, is this virus affects neural progenitor cells, um, basically destroys large parts of the brain. But at this stage of development, the brain, is, the skull is developed enough, but when the brain shrinks after it's destroyed, the skull collapses in on itself, and that's what causes the microcephaly. So uh, on this slide, uh, you can see this is what a normal head looks like. Uh, this is a baby with severe microcephaly. So you can see microcephaly just means small head, but you can see this is much different than just a small head. Uh, this is what's called fetal brain disruption sequence. Uh, and, and what's remarkable about this, that there was only a handful of cases of fetal brain uh, disruption sequence in the entire medical literature before any of this happened. So this is a very new phenomenon. It just does not mean small head. So this is a typical newborn uh, head CT scan. And this is a baby with uh, severe microcephaly. And you can see these white dots in here. Those are uh, cerebral, intracerebral calcifications. And these, these calcifications come about because as the neurons die, the pH of the brain changes and precipitates the calcium. This is a very, uh, if you see this, you've got to start thinking Zika virus. And this is the brain of the child. And as you can see, there's basically a rim of cortex left, and the rest is just filled with fluid. And so another characteristic of this is if you look on this infant, you can see uh, the scalp rugae. And that's because the, the skull was at normal size. And then when it shrunk, uh, the skin just folded over on itself. So this is a very typical uh, view of a, a child with severe uh, microcephaly. And um, the, other, the other thing that's very characteristic of this is atherosclerosis, which simply means uh, muscle contractures, and, and so you can see on these children that club feet, club foot is actually a very common outcome of this because simply when your brain is destroyed, the baby's not moving normally, uh, and 
And as a result, the baby, these, they develop these horrible contractures, which is really a very common uh, problem among these children. <coughs> So uh, this is another uh, head CT of another baby with uh, microcephaly. Um, and you can see that basically there's just a rim of uh, cerebral cortex left with, interest, uh, with calcifications. And this is an eye lesion uh, of that child. And what I'm told, I'm not an ophthalmologist by any means, but uh, this kind of lesion really hasn't been seen in other kinds of syndrome, so it's fairly unique. So we've seen a variety of uh, ocular manifestations. Some of these kids are born with no eyes, some of them are born with small eyes, and so the whole range of ocular manifestations is still yet to be determined. So, uh, so people often ask, well, what, what's the risk of getting an adverse outcome if the mother's infected, and we really don't have a lot of data yet. Um, a, a study looking, a modeling study looking, looking at the estimated risk of microcephaly in the first trimester in uh, Bahia, Brazil, where this outbreak started, suggested that the risk was 1 to 13 uh, percent, and um, with a negligible risk in the second and third trimesters. In Polynesia, they went back and did some modeling and said, well, the risk is about 1% in the first trimester. So, and but another study in Brazil that attempted to look at, um, look at uh, women who we knew, they knew were infected, they did fetal ultrasounds and then followed those children, uh, found that 29% had an abnormality. So, but the real number of ri the risk is, is, is yet to be determined somewhere between 1 and 29 percent. So Zika neurological disease, um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is what we're all concerned about. The frequency is unknown, but uh, looking back, the data suggests that's about 1 in 5,000 infections. Um, there's an increasing evidence of Zika virus infection that's now present in 19 countries. Um, what, but this is very unusual, Guillain-Barre syndrome, in that there's a very short period of uh, interval between acute illness and GPS. Uh, there's rapid progression of the clinical nadir, and there's also a high association with paresthesias. There's also been other case reports of other kinds of neurological abnormalities uh, where an association isn't clear yet. So this is an outbreak of, in several countries, an outbreak of Zika virus disease which you can see closely parallels an outbreak of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So th there's two studies, larger studies now, published uh, on Guillain-Barre syndrome with Zika, uh, one in French Polynesia and one in the last couple of weeks from Colombia. Um, you can see that the vast majority of people who developed Guillain-Barre syndrome were symptomatic. They, so whether, so it appears that having Zika sim symptoms uh, predisposes one to Guillain-Barre. Uh, but the median time from symptom onset to GBS in both of these cases was less than a week, which is very unusual for GBS, suggesting that there's really a direct uh, neuropathogenic effect rather than an immunologically mediated outcome. Uh, very high percentage have paresthesias, about a third uh, require mechanical ventilation. Uh, high protein, low cell count, typical of GBS. The EMGs were paradoxical. Um, in Colombia, they showed the AIDN form of, um, of GBS, but there were no anti-ganglioside antibodies, which would be unusual for this. Uh, whereas um, in Polynesia, they suggested the EMGs looked like they had the uh, acute demyelinating polyneuropathy <coughs> form. Excuse me, the acute motor axonal neuropathy form, sorry. So diagnostic testing is a mess, and I will, uh, there's basically three uh, choices. One is the RT-PCR, the other is serology, and the third is in immunohistochemistry in tissues. So 
uh, I'm going to start talking about uh, develop uh, talking about IgM antibodies. So, symptom onset over time. There's a brief viremia, followed by uh, a duration where I, IgM antibodies develop of unknown duration. We do not know under what conditions or how long IgM antibodies are actually present. But during this period of time, you can do, uh, do a MAP-ELISA test and look for IgM antibody. The problem is this is a total nightmare because for a lot of reasons. One is Zika virus antibodies cross-react with dengue. And in areas where this virus is circulating, like in Puerto Rico, 90% of the population has already had dengue. And, and there's dengue ep epidemics. Uh, the MAC-ELISA requires confirmation with plaque reduction neutralization tests. There's only three laboratories, three or four laboratories in the entire country that can do this. It takes five days to do it. So this produces angry messages because pregnant women want to know the results. And we tell them, well, it's going to take two weeks. People are not happy. Um, the other problem is the original antigenic sin in persons with previous dengue exposure develop a more uh, vigorous antibody response to dengue and Zika. So somebody with Zika looks like they have dengue. And, and, um, and the worst part is that plaque reduction neutralization tests can't differentiate these two in this sort of situation. Some people don't develop an IgM antibody response at all to Zika virus. And those that do, the IgM duration may be very short. And as a result of all this, uh, it's very difficult to diagnose this disease serologically. And because of this cross-reactivity, we tell people, pregnant women, well, you have a previous flaming virus infection, which isn't very satisfying <coughs> to somebody trying to figure out what to do about their pregnancy. Um, the, the more definitive diagnosis is with RT-PCR, uh, RT uh, which is short-lived in most people. But what we found is urine positivity lasts longer than its serum. So we now recommend that, that you send in urine tests as well as serum for PCR, because the urine is longer. Uh, whole blood may be longer. The virus, RT the virus may be present in, in whole blood for a much longer period of time, but the testing methodology is not yet standardized. This is our diagnostic algorithm. Uh, the bottom line, why I'm showing this slide is if you have somebody that needs a good diagnosis, go to this website and you can wade through this, but it looks something like the LA freeway system. It's very complicated, and we argue about this. Um, the other weird thing about this is, is that there are prolonged viremias in pregnant women, in certain pregnant women. So this is an example that was published in the New England Journal where a woman had uh, went to Central and South America, uh, then had a brief illness, then basically had a number of tests here and there that showed she was persistently viral, RNA enic, I should say for a number of months. Uh, she, the, the fetus at first was normal, then it had microcephaly. She terminated the pregnancy, and lo and behold, uh, the RNA present in serum disappeared. And so what we think is happening in these situations is the fetus is infected and seeding the mother rather than the other way around. And we've subsequently found a number of these women, and we really don't know quite yet what the whole significance of it is, but we think it's bad. Um, clinical management basically is one slide. There is no clinical management other than supportive. Uh, just don't give anti-inflammatory drugs or aspirin to these people because they may have dengue. Um, now I just want to touch on non-mosquito borne transmission modes, and this creates the biggest problem with respect to um, how we think about some of our prevention efforts. Um, so it's been proven to be transmitted by blood transfusion. The U.S. blood supply is now screened for Zika virus at a cost of $100 million a year. Um, percutaneous exposure, sexual contact has been found from symptomatic and asymptomatic men to women. Uh, female 
symptomatic person to a male, as well, and a male symptomatic person to another male. Uh, intrauterine transmission, uh, which we talked about, or intrapartum transmission from a viremic mother to a newborn, and person to person by unknown means. This was the case in Utah. Possible in breast milk, you can find the virus in breast milk, and organ and tri tissue transplantation is also another potential risk. So what do we know about sexual transmission? Uh, for one thing, the, the uh, persistence of viral RNA is present in most people for less than 60 days. And uh, viral RNA has been documented, though, in semen up to 188 days. So it's kind of like the Ebola situation, where you find persistence of viral RNA uh, for present in, in some time in, in the semen of some people. And it's present in very, very high titer. And, uh, but the thing is, is only replicated virus has only been found in people up to 69 days. So what does these, these prolonged vire or RNA, I don't know what you would call it, our prolonged presence of RNA in semen, what does it really mean? And what's the transmission risk? And looking at travelers coming back, we've only seen uh, transmission within 20 days of the first sexual contact. The problem is there's a certain bias, because when people go travel and then they come back, they usually don't wait three months to have sex with their partner. So they usually, from our experience with this, they usually wait about less than three days. And, and so if sexual contact is going to occur, it's going to occur quickly. Uh, what's not known is what is the absolute risk to symptomatic people have a higher risk of transmission? What's the duration of risk? What's the contribution of fetal infection during pregnancy? Because if you think about it, there's a very lot of virus in sperm, and where are you putting sperm in an area that's going to go straight to the uterus? And, um, and what, so what the contribution of causing fetal infection is of sexual transmission is yet to be known. And is there a risk, a periconception risk as well? We don't know. So as a result of, of all this, we're saying that uh, couples in which a, a woman is pregnant, if there's a partner at risk, they should use condoms consistently or correctly and abstain from sex throughout the duration of pregnancy. This is a hard message to give to people. Generally, people do not like to use condoms if their partner is already pregnant. But, so, this has been very difficult to implement in reality. Um, and, and the other issue is the periconception risk. So we now recommend that women wait at least eight weeks after symptom onset or possible exposure. Men, and this number, there's really no scientific basis of it to it, to be honest with you. Because uh, we don't know what the risk is and for how long it actually is. Uh, for men, the, we uh, suggest that you wait six months before attempting conception because of this problem of the prolonged viral RNA in urine. So obviously one of the big prevention messages we have is pregnant women should not go to areas where Zika virus is being transmitted. Uh, but the problem is if you live in one of those areas, it's kind of a problem. Because uh, we can't tell people to get out of Dodge. Uh, the other uh, problem is when this virus becomes endemic throughout most of the world now, what are you going to tell people? You can't tell them, well, don't go anywhere. So this messaging is going to be harder and harder to get as these epidemics go from epidemic to endemic. Uh, we also advise people that if you do go, stay in an area with you. Uh, a hotel with air conditioning because simply because the mosquitoes can't get in your house and use repellents but if you and wear long sleeves and shirts and long pants to keep mosquitoes off you but if you think about it how many people go to tropical areas and wear long sleeves and long pants it's generally not a very comfortable thing to do and you can't wear mosquito repellent 24 hours a day and many people living in these areas do not have air conditioning so it's a very very difficult uh, to prevent these infections, in particularly in an endemic or epidemic area. 
So mosquito control is the name of the game here, at least. Uh, there are three choices. One is source reduction, which simply means get rid of the mosquito breeding sites. Larvicide and adulticide can be done in a variety of ways. Uh, in recent years, there's an almost universal failure to control dengue outbreaks using ground-based approaches because it's hard to find all the, all the mosquito breeding sites. This is a truck spraying in Miami. This is an airplane flying over uh, the Linwood area of Miami Beach uh, doing an aerial spraying. And this is the reaction to this <laughs> as people with uh, gas masks and whatever. Uh, the, the crazy part about this is that, that after aerial spraying events, pesticide exposures and people go down, not up. The reason they go down is because People don't like mosquitoes, so they go to Home Depot, buy pesticides, and get pesticides on themselves. This is a far better way of controlling mosquitoes. So people should like this. And this is what's happened in, um, in the Wingwood area. Um, this area in black are, are mosquito counts. This was the first aerial spraying here, and you can see that counts almost dropped to zero and stayed pretty low after that, so it, it worked. Um, a variety of, the end, the end result of all this, I think that is where we want to get is have a Zika vaccine. There's a number of vaccines being developed. There will be no Zika vaccine uh, for at least two or three years. And so we're basically uh, stuck with mosquito control and other prevention messages for the time being. So that concludes my talk. Um, the findings and conclusions of this report, I mean, the CDC takes no responsibility for whatever I've just said. <laughs> but if you want more information, go to our website. Thank you. <laughs> my name is Ross Bierland. I'm one of the chief residents of the Department of Medicine. And on behalf and on, on behalf of the Department of Medicine, just wanted to say thank you very much to Dr. Peterson for that excellent clinical update on Zika. I think it's something very important for us all to know about in the field right now. Um, Dr. Peterson was uh, nice enough to take the questions. So if there are any questions, um, be happy to pass a mic to you. Just please say your name and uh, the department or the school that you're with. Lyle, thanks very much for that. Uh, Fred Hayden, uh, Department of Medicine. Um, you, one area of mosquito control that I think has received a lot of interest, uh, at least in, pub in some public health circles, of course, are ways to manipulate Aedes and try to prevent the spread not only of Zika, but uh, the other pathogens that it can, it can transmit. So would you comment on genetically modified mosquitoes and the Wolbachia uh, infected mosquitoes and how those, how, what, what have we learned about that so far? Is, is that going to be a reality going forward? Um, well, as far as the genetically modified mosquitoes, there's people out there with the gas masks on. They don't like genetically modified mosquitoes either, and I think it's going to be an issue of uh, public acceptance. It's being done in other countries. I think the one issue with that is scalability. Um, the, that company that does the genetically modified mosquitoes called me up a week ago last Friday and said, can I have $10 million so I can be, build a mosquito factory? And I said, well, how far can you ship these mosquitoes? Well, 300 miles maybe at the most. And so building $10 million mosquito factories every 300 miles doesn't seem like a very practical approach. I think the technology is good, but the public acceptance is bad. So whether it happens in this country or not is yet to be determined. As far as Wolbachia goes, uh, for those of you who don't know the whole Wolbachia story, it's a, a, a bacteria that infects insects. And then it does two things in Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, depending on the strain. One is it, it um, makes them infertile when an infected female mates with an uninfected male. Actually, it's the other way around. And the other thing it, it can do is it can inhibit uh, viral replication of the mosquito. The problem with Wolbachia is that these mosquitoes don't fly very far. So 
you may put Wabaki over here, and then four blocks later, there's no mosquitoes with Wabakia. So you've got to have really spread them around and hope that they propagate in the population. And Aedes aegypti mosquitoes do not normally have Wabaki in them, although most insects do. So there's some genetic reason why they normally don't have Wabakia. So whether this approach can work on a large scale is yet to be determined, but I think it is one of the more promising methods. Thanks very much for that. The um, just wondering if you could speculate on kind of what happened with Yap. I mean, it seemed like this thing was all was very quiet. Um, no one was thinking about it at all. The urbanization and the travel stuff seems to apply um, very well to what's happening now in the world and in Brazil. But Yap is not very urbanized. And it seems like just something strange happened there in 2007. Um, and I don't know if you have any speculations as to what happened there. Um, I cannot say anything intelligent about what happened on Yap because I have no idea. Um, the, only, the only thing one might think about is these, although these populations, these islands do not have large populations, they are fairly crowded. People live pretty close together to each other in these areas. Um, so there is crowding. And the only possibility is, I mean, one of the major possibilities is that somebody from somewhere happened to go, let's say from Southeast Asia, where it may be endemic, went to Yap, which was virgin territory, and set it off. But that's only a matter of speculation. Right now, we don't have any real genet firm genetic evidence that the virus has actually changed or became more transmissible or more pathogenic. Those studies have yet to be done. Hi, I'm Annalie Boyle. I'm with the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Um, so I find this very difficult in counseling my patients. You mentioned the somewhere between 1 to 29 risk of transmission if done in the first trimester. My question is, looking at patients who have um, we don't have um, an antenatal diagnosis of evidence of Zika um, on ultrasound or MRI. What portion of those will um, have neonates that are affected? Much like congenital rubella syndrome, not all ch children who are exposed to rubella have evidence at birth, but then later develop like the chorioretinitis and the uh, congenital deafness. Do we have any idea um, what portion of infants we don't suspect have um, um, evidence of Zika infection, but we'll go on to develop congenital Zika um, yeah, syndrome. Good, mm -hmm. good question, a very important one. And the answer is, we don't know. The case I showed you, uh, the woman had two normal ultrasounds before an abnormal one. You know, and the real only reason the abnormal one was even done was that they noticed this persistent RNA presence in her, in her serum and was wondering what was going on. So uh, anecdotally, we know we're missing a lot on ultrasound, but I can't give you a percentage. We just don't know it. Uh, we are following, we have a US pregnancy registry, uh, so we will get that information eventually, but we're just not there yet. Thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time, but Dr. Peterson will be down here for a few minutes if others have um, questions. Um, it's sort of remarkable how much is known about Zika, but also quite remarkable how much remains to be learned uh, from this. We invite you to come back next week. We're, con we're continuing the mosquito theme. Uh, next week is Karen Masterson and Dick Pearson on the Malaria Project, the secret government mission for a cure. And please join us then. Please join me in thanking Lyle Peterson.